but I, I got one story from there that was like epic for me. Um, I woke up in the morning because, you know, like, you know, that, that was just all we were there for. I woke up in the morning with $582 to my name and I'm playing 2040 Limit Hold'em. That's not enough of a bankroll, okay? The first hour and a half, I lose every pot and I've got 82 bucks left and I'm under the gun. Welcome everybody to Dat Poker Podcast, episode 165. It is May the 24th, 2024. I'm your host, A. Schwartz, alongside uh, producer and co-host, producer extraordinaire, co-host Terrence Chan in the same room. Uh, fellas, how are you? Doing great. I'm here. I'm where the magic happens. Look, I'm in Ross's window. It happens. It's the the... It's where the sausage is made. It's, it's it's amazing. It's an honor and a blessing to be here at the official Dat Poker Studio podcast. That uh, is uh, too much yeah. sausage discussion for that window. So we'll go to Daniel Negreanu in Las Vegas. Daniel, how are you? How the vegan sausage is made? Uh, I'm I'm handling. I got my new my 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 gym is being built right now. So the workers coming at seven a.m. We made a deal during the World Series of Poker. No hammering before ten thirty. Because it messes me up, and I've been napping all day, and I'm I still get the grogginess, and that's not good for poker. But I'll be ready. Don't worry, I'll be ready for the draft. And nice, we'll get one. to all that in a minute. A um, couple of sad notes. So let's uh, right off the top, let's uh, let's talk about uh, two sort of saddish notes. Well, one for sure uh, that happened in the World Series of Poker, and uh, that is the passing of uh, legendary uh, music producer and poker player Steve Albini from the Chicago area. Steve. Uh, passed away at uh, way too young an age uh, recently and you know Steve was really he was a legend in the music industry as I mentioned he's the audio engineer for many of the bands that defined the music of not just my generation but following generations bands like uh, the Pixies, uh, Bush, PJ Harvey, uh, Manic Street Preachers, Cheap Trick and of course um, he was at the man the, he was the man at the controls for Nirvana's album uh, In Utero um, and, and a staple in the Chicago poker scene, like our buddy uh, Grapes, um, quite close to Steve, as well as several other guys um, uh, from Chicago, from the Chicago Limit poker scene. Of course, he won two World Series of Poker bracelets um, and uh, two mixed game bracelets uh, as well. And we actually interviewed Steve on uh, Dat Poker Podcast episode 125, if you want to run back and, and check that out after his second bracelet. Um, Steve, uh, actually, Roger, uh, you, uh, Ross, you might run a little bit of that interview at the end, right? Yeah, yeah, I think I would throw it right in the audio the, podcast. Um, yeah, uh, audio yeah, exactly. Maybe some of that yeah. in there, uh, just to get sort of a feel about Steve and and how much he loved poker, um, and how you know much of an integral uh, part of the Chicago poker scene that he was, as well as um, you know in Las Vegas at the World Series of Poker, he loved poker and. And Steve was, he was uh, amazing. I never really got a chance to spend uh, a ton of time with him, but, um, you know, the legend about Steve is amazing where, you know, back in the day when he's, when he is, he hated, I think the, the term producing, but he was the audio engineer for, for some of the bands that I mentioned. And, and back in the day, you would take a percentage of the band, uh, the album, sorry, the, the album sales when you, when you produced an album for that band. Um, and uh, Steve wouldn't do that. Steve took... Uh, I think it was four hundred and fifty dollars a day for his service, and and could have made millions, but he thought it was exploiting uh, those bands. So he he eschewed that and and took his daily fee, and and uh, you know really stood by his principles. If you followed him on on Twitter at all, you saw that he was super opinionated, um, and didn't suffer fools, and and didn't care. And and you know real legend is gone, uh, sadly too soon. Um, Terrence, did you ever get a chance to to meet Steve? Yeah, I was there the the night he won that second bracelet, the second bracelet. It was his last night in Las Vegas. And as it would turn out, it would be his last World Series of Poker ever event. So first of all, how epic is that? To the last World Series of Poker event you ever played, you won. That's guaranteed for him. So that's fucking legend status right there. Um, yeah, he was great. He was over the moon. He was, I, you know, I hear through uh, Grapes, Matt Grape and theme that he was really excited to return to the World Series of Poker this year. Here we are on the eve next, you know, this will be our last show before the World Series probably and, and everybody's excited to go and the the energy's in the air and, uh, you know, I've been getting messages from random people on Twitter saying, I'll be there or, you know, I, I won't be there, but I'll be cheering for you, all this kind of stuff. And, 
you know, it, it's it's a reminder of how blessed we are to be able to get to play this thing and participate in this thing because Steve really wanted to go this year. He missed um, the the twenty three World Series due to some health issues uh, with his partner, but he was he was excited to come back and return. And it's really sad; it's a big loss for poker that he won't be able to return this year. And yeah, if you want to get to know more about him, uh, me and Ross interviewed him back during that that uh you know second World Series of poker bracelet win of his, uh, I believe fifteen hundred horse. Uh, he loved the mixed games, and yeah. Uh, good friends with with a lot of the names of poker and matt uh brandon jack harris and brian hastings and all those those chicago poker guys so we lost a good one for sure yeah super sad and uh and and you know it, it's it's uh, terrence you, you said it perfectly you know uh, as poker players we tend to look at things like the world series and try and find the negatives and pick at it and do this and do that and and for a guy to not be able to go back out and play and do the thing he loved we got to keep in perspective that this you know, they work on it and they try harder, you know, they're in the business to make money. So let's just relax with how much rate they charge or all that kind of stuff and pick at it because they provide us with this opportunity to get together with friends and have these life experiences that, that Steve loved and cherished and, and isn't going to be able to get. And, and we all are. So, so let's just sort of try and keep everything. I know it's hard because, you know, uh, we are who we are and we, and we like to, to be opinionated on a bunch of stuff, but but let's you know maybe think twice a little bit about uh, about uh, what an experience it is for us this year. So going forward, that's that's <laughs> I guess what I would ask uh, in lieu of of uh, what happened with Steve. So uh, all right, we'll move on quickly. Um, one other sad note, uh, not on, on the same level, but um, the uh, Mirage Poker, well, the Mirage in general, including the Poker Room, uh, is closing in July and will be completely renovated. It'll be opening up as a new Hard Rock Hotel in 2027 on the strip right where where it is now uh, i think if you remember back in the day the hard rock was sort of back uh, a little bit southeast uh, uh, and and closed down but uh, it's coming back uh, uh, and they bought the mirage and they're they're going to completely renovate it in two or three years and, and bring it back but but that gives us an opportunity to think back and look at what kind of impact the mirage poker room had on the future of poker had on uh, all of the experiences that we had um, growing up it was the the sort of the shining beacon of of poker rooms to come to to play at uh for poker players back in i think it was 89 somewhere in the late 80s when it opened um and then you know going forward after sort of the horseshoe um, you know, the Mirage was the place to play that you walked in and, and the great thing about poker, and I know you guys have lots to say about this and we'll get to it, but the great thing about poker for me is the ability to, it doesn't matter who you are. All that matters is, do you have a buy-in to sit down in the poker game? And this is what sort of encompassed the Mirage, because I remember going in as a limit player and jumping in and seeing, oh, there's a 40-80 limit game there. And that's, well, that's about twice as big or three times as big as I usually play, but Todd Brunson's in the game, Daniel Negreanu's in the game, Jen Harmon's in the game. Um, maybe I'm going to take a shot. Should I play in this game? Is it over my bankroll? Yeah, but I'm at the Mirage, and and these people are playing in this game, and that's the great thing about poker is, you know, I'm not going to be able to go shoot hoops with LeBron, but I can go sit down if I have a buy-in to go play in these games. And that's when I think about the Mirage, I think about that. I think about the green carpet as you walk in. I think about the... The, the the fish tank at the front desk. I think about the California pizza kitchen. I think about the chips. Um, there's so many great memories I have of uh, walking into the Mirage and just being on the same level as everybody else if I had a bankroll to buy in. And, and I had some great times. I had some wins. I had some losses like all of us. Um, but I thoroughly enjoyed the Mirage. I'm sad it's, it's no longer there. Uh, admittedly, I hadn't been there in a long time, but um, it is closing, and, and you know, Daniel, I know you have a lot to say, but Terrence, maybe run us, walk us through a little bit before Daniel does about what your memories are of the Mirage and, and, and what you think about when you look back on it. Sure, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a young man compared to you gentlemen, so you know, I, uh, I first played at the Mirage, I think I was 21 in the year 2000, or sorry, I was 21 in the year 2001, but I did play underage at 2000. I played uh, three six and six twelve limit hold'em, and uh, you know I you know Dan, Adam talked about all the celebrities in the room, and I I looked around. Actually, what's funny is that I think the biggest celebrity that I saw on that particular day was was Mason Malmuth, who Dan, Daniel's good close personal buddy that that uh, <laughs> they hang out all the time. Yeah. Um, but I was actually there mostly to watch my friend play. I think it was like. $20 straight limit single draw low ball. Not like 
no limit single draw low ball. They used to play like low ball apparently with just a straight limit. I don't know why they do. I don't know what was with poker in the eighties and nineties. You guys, you guys tell me. Um, but it was cool. You know, I it was it was definitely the first poker room I ever I ever played. Um, I remember stepping up to the six twelve game and like misreading my hand and feeling like the biggest jackass who ever lived. Uh, but but it was great. It was you know for me the Bellagio I think probably holds the spot that the Mirage holds for you guys because I'm just like a few I came along just a few years after that after you guys and I, I'm just a little bit younger. Um, and one day that place is probably going to close down and I'll feel that that gut feeling in in my my stomach that you guys probably felt. But Daniel, you've got a you you put in a lot of years in that place I'm sure. It's blood, sweat, and tears, man. It's yeah. For me, I, when I saw the news, it actually was like, oh, man, it kind of stung a little bit. Um, just the other day, Maury was here at my house to check out something. And, you know, he said, so he said, like, there will never be another poker room like the Mirage ever. Like, first of all, the location was perfect. You know, um, when you look at the Bellagio, you look at different places, it's sort of tucked away in a corner. The poker room was right in the middle of the room. So every time people got let out of a show, you know, whatever show they were going to see, whether Siegfried and Roy or something, they're like, walking in and they, you know, there's poker. So you'd have guys there that had money and they'd be like, I'll sit down and blow thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 or something like that, which, you know, it's very rare to get walk-ins like that and big games like that. I know my, um, my wife's brother was just in town and, you know, he, 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 even he was nostalgic about it. He used to like to go to pizza kitchen, you know, watch the sports. And it was just kind of a vibe. Like for me, I can still smell the murk. I mean, I can't, I smell, I remember those walks. I remember hearing, Steve Wynn's voice in the loudspeaker and seeing the tiger is on my way. And for me, you know, it was incredibly nostalgic because that was really where I, start, you know, that's where I started. It was Mirage and the Binion's Horseshoe. I'd come to play the World Series, but the cash games you played at Mirage, you played the tournaments mainly downtown. And I remember like, just the, the poker room was like, I liked it a lot better than Bellagio anyway. I, when I went to Bellagio, it felt like fruity and light and blah, blah, blah. I liked the dark wood. I liked it looking like a poker room. I mean, there was smoking back then, which wasn't ideal. So you had those people with the ashless, uh, you know, cigarette, like what do you call it, uh, ashtrays and stuff like that. But the room itself, I mean, stories from then, like you said, it was really like, it's really actually too, what people don't know about is, is the Mirages where mixed games were born. And how it started was as simple as this. Stud was very, ha very, very popular. So was Holden, right? But stud players played stud and Holden players played Holden. Well, at the higher stakes, there just wasn't a lot of, there wasn't enough bodies, right? So the stud players are like, I'm not going to play your game. And the holding players are like, I'm not going to play your game. That's not fair. So, okay, well, what if we play a round of each? What do you play both? And then, of course, it, you know, spawned with Omaha and different things like that. You know, I remember looking back at, like, just some epic times. I remember Hamid Dismalchi and Ted Forrest playing Heads Up Raz. And I would go and play my session, go home and sleep, go and play my session. They're still there. Day three, Hamid had probably ingested who knows how much alcohol and amphetamines and whatever. They had to, like, literally an ambulance game. To take him out like it was the only way to be a wait for like legit three four days i remember even like you know for me i'm grinding like 10 20 20 40 just trying not to go broke and i, I would look at the because there's it was like three steps up to 48 you just I mean, i'd be looking i'd see jennifer with her leg up and a coors light and todd and everybody and i remember the first time i didn't know her at the time yet she's like come have a seat and i'm like oh no no you know, i don't want to i'm not gonna play 40 80. um but i, I got one story from there that was like epic for me. Um, I woke up in the morning because, you know, like, you know, that, that was just all we were there for. I woke up in the morning with $582 to my name and I'm playing 2040 Limit Hold'em. That's not enough of a bankroll, okay? The first hour and a half, I lose every pot and I've got 82 bucks left and I'm under the gun. So it's like, do I put the 20 bucks in and just run it? But then it's like 10 a.m. What the fuck am I going to do in Vegas for two days? Right? Because it's all I have. I don't have access to bar. I wasn't, you know, I didn't wasn't a name. So I took that 82 bucks off the table and I said, what's the smallest game I can play? One to five stud. I go play one to five stud and it's pretty easy. I win $104. Now I got, you know, I got myself 186. I said, like, okay, well, there's 612 over. I went another hundred over there. I got 286. You know what? Hey, I could play 1020 and 286. Boom. Win $400. So I'm playing my own tournament essentially at the Mirage. <laughs> 680 bucks. I'm like, Back to 2040 we go. That's more than I started with. So now, you know, I win like a thousand in the 2040. I'm up to 1600. I'd never played 4080 before, but I go, today's the day. <laughs> so I went from like saving that 82 bucks, just grinded it out. And I ended up with like $4,000 by the end of the day. I had all the chips at the end and it was pretty wild. Like I sort of, 
And it, but really it all was spawned because I couldn't get any other money. And it was like, what else am I going to do in Vegas? You know, like you ever had that where you're just like, this is my case money. I don't, I don't want to, but I, what else? I don't want to go broke here, but obviously playing 80 bucks in 2040, that wasn't going to give me a lot of leeway. One to five stud, you know, I recreated a bankroll. So I have some great memories of going broke at that place many, many times. I want to talk about the famous whales because I know, I know one time Bill Gates showed up at the Mirage and this was, this went around a lot. And I think, I think he was literally playing three, six, like not, not 300, 600, not 3,600. I think he was playing literal three, six. He also played the one five stud. Oh, did he also play that? Yeah. And, uh, you know, as the story goes, I think Doyle invites him to come up and play the big game. And, you know, Bill's like, you know, no thanks. And, you know, whatever, whatever Doyle's playing, whether it's 4,000, 8,000, I don't know what, what size games it was at the time, but I remember thinking at the time, it doesn't matter for, for Bill, whether he's playing three, six or 4,000, 8,000, it's actually exactly the same thing. He's there to play poker, but yeah, there must be. Right. Because like, you think a guy like him who's competitive or whatever, it's like, oh, if the money doesn't matter at all, why not cut your teeth against the highest yeah. level? Like if you play a video game, why would you play like easy novice when you could like sit down and play pro level? And I guess cause he's easy novice himself. I mean, you play a video game, you, you know, you don't, I, I, I don't know, but I remember, uh, I, I remember that story distinctly and people running. I remember like the first early math guys would run us run simulations about if, if, uh, if Bill Gates played Doyle, at 3,000, 6,000, and let's assume Doyle has this much bankroll and Bill's has this much bankroll, but Doyle's EV is this higher, like who goes broke first? And almost always, no matter how you run the simulation, Bill, uh, uh, like Doyle comes out ahead. Like it just, it just kind of like, he has to, he has to win because there's, there's just, there is, as it turns out, enough skill to, to overcome, you know, bad bankroll management, unless, unless you're just playing so big that, I mean, the round is really like, you remember, like, when you think of Mirage, like, just just the ending scene, you know, he's off to Mirage. Yeah. And then it was like, yep. it really was the center of the poker universe. It was where, like, it was right before poker started to blow up, you know, like, it wasn't like what, what it was, what it is today. So you would like, you'd see the Mason Malmuth. I remember the first time I saw Mason Malmuth play and he wrote books and everything. I'm like, oh, this guy's a real pro, right? Mm -hmm. He was fucking steam. I could see steam coming out of his face was Beat red. He's playing some 10, 20 game, three bet and blah, 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 like a maniac, just absolute stone cold, full blown tilt. That was the first time I ever saw Mason. And then I'd see David Slansky around and he would do his, his little tricks, you know, <laughs> come in behind the button, try to get some free hands, all this sort of stuff. But uh, yeah, it was a different time. And for me, I guess it's nostalgic because of the age I was and where, you know, I think everyone has that. In a, like you were mentioning, Terrence, it might be a different room for you. But for me, the Mirage was where, like, I remember the walks home from the Mirage to Budget Suites, like, because I would stay at, on Paradise and Twain, which is in an area I would stay in now. Um, but I used to walk back, and many times I'd walk back without any money and just, like, have those introspective life moments. Like, what am I, what am I going to do? You know, what, what am I going to do? And then wake up the next day and try to figure it out, you know. But uh, those moments were really valuable for me. It really forced introspection and just, I don't know, something about the Mirage – like I said, I can still smell it. I don't know if I'm proud or embarrassed to say that I actually stayed a whole summer with a girlfriend at that budget suites. Oh, I lived it. I lived it. Yes. Well, I really did up from like when I would go, what I, what I used to do is you rent it by the month, right? It's yeah. like 700 bucks a month or something. It was a good deal. And then what happened was around 99, I'm like, you know, cause you rent for the month, you'd leave, you'd go back, but I was staying so much. I'm like, I'm just going to keep it. So I would leave my stuff there, go back to Toronto. And then I would come back because I knew I wanted to come back, right? So that was like my first like apartment, if you will, was that budget suites until you know, I started to make some money and you know rented an actual house. Well, and that's the thing too, right? Like there was, I, correct me if I'm wrong, Daniel. I played more in Las Vegas. I did play obviously at the Mirage, but I, but I played a lot not in Las Vegas, Los Angeles, where um, there was no no limit hold'em until you know late '90s. I, and I, I'm trying to think back to the Mirage, and I don't think there was a lot of no limit. It was all limit games, right? No, the only big bet game you would have found is during the World Series of Poker, Bobby Hoff, Carl McKelvey, um, a couple other guys would start a pot limit hold'em game. Like pot limit hold'em with, with no, no ante, just pot limit. Uh, there was no no limit spread. The only no limit you'd find was tournaments, right? And at Mirage, I don't think I'd ever, I don't think there ever was a no limit game. I don't think, I can't even remember ever one running. You know, they had like, they had the stud games, 
you had the Holden tables, you had like an Omaha eight or two, and then you had the small stuff, but never did you find a, uh, a straight, like no limit Holden game. Cause again, that really didn't start happening until after the WPT aired around 2003, right before Moneymaker, yeah. when people started seeing this game on TV and now they would walk into casinos and go, Hey, you know, I want to, I want to play that game that I was watching on TV. And so they would want to play, uh, you know, no limit hold them. And that's how the game spread. But before that, and even at the World Series, the largest event, the World Series of Poker, was always the first event. And it was Limit Holdem. You know, Terrence Dream Days. There were, I remember Josh Area won one like years ago, 2000 or 2000. Like the Limit Holdem used to draw. No Limit was like, you know, because again, where, you know, where would you have practiced No Limit Holdem? Only in tournaments. I'll, I'll tell you where in Las Vegas, because I, around the year, 99 wanted to play no limit hold'em because i'd never played it before and this was before the wpd and all this stuff you could play one two no limit at the stratosphere back in this because i that's what i would do i would i would go and pull out the card player magazine and go like line by line through every casino that had a part card room and card player and i would actually like phone them to see like like what games to try and in the stratosphere is where i played one two no limit for the first time and bought in for like 50 bucks it was, it was awesome. So, what, Daniel, if you think back to, you know, when you were playing, not maybe you weren't playing in the biggest game in the room at the Mirage, but what would have been the biggest game in the room? Who would have been in that? I mean, you mentioned some of the names, but, uh, um, you know, Ted and, and, and Phil Ivey maybe at the time. I, I'm not sure, but what would have well, been the biggest game? Phil Ivey was not existent in the in, – he, he was an Atlantic City guy. By that time, he was still in his early 20s. You know, he had not even made it to Vegas once. So the big game that like where Ted was playing against Hamid, I think they were playing 800, 1600. The regular game, the regular stud game was 500, 1000. And it ran around a guy named Jay Botchman who lost a lot of money in those games. But then he had all these poker players invest in this company. You know, he's like, oh, it's a good stock or whatever. And like he scammed them all or whatever. So he got even, I think, in the end. He got it back. Yeah. But yeah, then, like I said, it was very... It was like there was a stud game. The 4080 was the biggest limit holding game you'd find. Not until we moved to Bellagio did we start running like, well, there was a couple, there was 75, 150 at Mirage occasionally, but not until we moved to Bellagio did we start to have uh, 100, 200 or 8160. And I remember distinctly the big mistake that we found. And it's so crazy how optics play a role. But when we were playing 100, 200, originally we were just using like black chips, $100 chips. The game was fucking terrible, right? Why would that be? Why would that matter, right? When we switched to green chips and you played with quarters and now betting 200 was eight green chips and now the pots look massive and you had people chasing, it had a massive effect on the playability of the game when people had like, because if you had 2K and black chips, that's just like one little puny stack. So people like would, you know, hold on to them. But when you had a rack, you know, you're 2000 and it's like a big rack, you're like, okay. I can yeah, Bellagio has 10 and $20 chips for that reason. I mean, you don't find them anywhere else, but you've got 10 and $20 chips at Bellagio, so you can play 30, 60, and 40, 80 with, with that, with the extra chips in play. Yeah, and now we find ourselves uh, playing at the Aria and the Wynn and the Venetian and, and different rooms. And, you know, I guess that's the, the, world. Yep. that's the difference now, right? Because the poker scene is spread over five, six, seven rooms in Vegas, whereas it was basically two it was the horseshoe or or the mirage where the games were and and you know obviously the horseshoe uh, was there for the world series of poker but but maybe not the rest of the year so it does change the landscape significantly um and you know as maury said it'll never be the same we'll never have another room like that so um it's fun to think back and and have some memories and 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 talk about the stuff that happened there but uh we'll move on we mentioned the world series of poker uh we are mere hours away as shall i dare i say uh starting uh next week with uh with the full schedule that we broke down um earlier in our podcast um i was just i just came back from a uh a golf tournament with uh, a whole bunch of poker players that are going to be at the World Series, and everybody is pumped up. It's the the big uh, topic of discussion. The 25K Fantasy is coming up on Monday. Uh, there was a lot of talk about that and who's playing um, tons of events and who isn't. And and uh, and I'm sure Danny, you got all the uh, the insight on on some of the some of the players. But uh, uh, we're looking forward to it. And and uh, it's Christmas Eve, really, is what it is here for poker players. Uh, we got to get through this weekend, and then. Uh, we're right into the middle of it uh, next week. Uh, Daniel, what's your uh, prep been like? Are you feeling good? Are you? Uh, I, I know most years you're you're hitting the gym because you know you're going to be eating like shit for like two months straight, and you usually kind of trim down. What's uh, what's been the protocol this year? 
Yeah, so no, I did that. I didn't have quite as much time as I normally do. I put in about four weeks in the gym and eating right. And then Amanda's brother came to town this week. So we went golfing a little bit, and got off track, if you will. And then, of course, now I have, like I said, I'm at the house, we're building a gym and they show up at 7 a.m. in the morning. It's, it's actually kind of a, a good thing that this happened to me right now because like I, I, mean, I know how much how important sleep is, right? So practicing what I'm doing right now, which is like not getting enough sleep, I've been sort of groggy all day. It really, like, if I had to play poker right now, I'd be horrendous. I'd be terrible. So that just sort of tells me that, like, you know, like I'm on to something with, with what I'm thinking here um, in terms of like sleep being the priority. And so this year, I'm going to actually get a room for the entirety of it. And I told my wife, the plan is every time I make a day two, you know, or a bag, that I'm going to stay there, save the hour there and hour back, and try to just focus on getting maximum sleep because. I don't, I mean, some of you guys, I don't know how you do it. Sleep on five, six hours. I get eight hours like a baby every night. If I get seven, it messes me up. Like I'm a, I'm a good sleeper. I'm really, really, it's one of my skills. Nice. Uh, Terrence, uh, what are your thoughts on uh, Christmas Eve here? Are you pumped? Are you excited? You're coming down. I know you're going to play uh, a bunch of the limit events. Um, but excitement level, one to 10. How, where are you at? It's, I mean, it's, I mean, it's always at least like an eight because it's the World Series. And actually, I'll, 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 bit, I'll chop that down again. Right now, sitting here on May the twenty fourth evening, it's probably like a sixth. And then when the day comes, it's going to be an eight. And then I'm going to walk into that fucking place, and it's going to be a ten. Like that's that's what it is. Um, yeah, I've got you know whatever seven or eight events circled on my calendar. I've been playing playing the online mixed games, uh, sharpening the sword a little bit. Watch it. You know, I made me made some deep runs actually in the in the online mixed games um this last couple of weeks and so i've been watching my own replays of my own final tables watching other players watching watching people that i know are legitimately better at me and watching them make make the decisions with the whole cards up always a great way to study you know daniel we've had a lot of discussion on the show about how what does daniel's study looks like and you know daniel always says his study uh, these days often looks less like solvers and more about watching the footage um you know, of the high roller events that he plays in or that other guys plays in. And, and my version of that is, is basically like the online replays and things like that, because you know, I don't play 50 K no limit tournaments and stuff like that, that are on broadcast on TV. But what I do play is, is online tournaments and, you know, the, the cards are often face up and you've got, you know, if you got games like draw games, you get to see what people started with, what they discarded, what they kept. There's a, there's a whole wealth of information out there about like, Oh, you know, like I would have made this play in this situation, but he made that play. Like, Hmm, I wonder who's right. And, and just sort of thinking over those spots. That's what my prep looks like. Uh, I also don't plan to work out or be in shape. I don't sleep as well as Daniel. I wish I did. I, even if I, even if I go to bed at the right time, I just, sometimes I can't sleep past 6am. I don't know what it is. It, it, maybe it's about having kids, but I, I wake up at 6am. It doesn't matter if I went to bed at 10pm. It doesn't matter if I went to bed at 2am. I'm still waking up at six. And then, so I got to find a way to, to fix that because that's just not going to work when I mostly play, 2 p.m. events uh, that that go deep into the night, and uh, I I'll, I'll tell you what the first it was so funny the first event I played was Badugi actually last year, and I had I was running on four hours of sleep because I missed my flight. I had to connect two times through Seattle. I came in on the morning, uh, got like no sleep, and I think three times on the first round, I three bet somebody, and I looked down and I did not have a three card hand. I had a two card hand and a pair or I had just two, like, I, I don't know. Like I would just have like, I would just have, you know, I'd have ace, deuce, deuce, four, but like the, 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 you know, the, the four wasn't suited to the ace. It was just, it was just a disaster. And Dan Zach looked at me and says, I should play with you more often. And I, and I was like, yeah, yeah. But I played better on the second day. So, you know, yeah, sleep, very important. Me, not so good at getting it. So I'm interested um, to, you know, uh, I think you're a pretty self-aware dude and you uh, have been on top of the sort of the online poker world in the past um, with Limit Hold'em specifically. Uh, would you look at your your hands that you were talking about face up? Where do you think you are? And in, in, in as far, how sharp do you think you are heading into the World Series of Poker? I mean, I think it's really hard to say because... Uh, you know, it's it's hard to know in a, like a context exactly what's the right play in the right moment. I think it's more important to think about like why somebody that you respect or think is good might have made a play, or you know, and I can look at somebody and say, "Whoa, that's just an objectively bad play." Like under those circumstances, I I feel I feel comfortable. I mean, my results have been really good in the last little while, uh, 
and you know obviously like tournament sample size is is small but i mean i had like two seconds and a third in only three events this week and i've i've had lots of really deep runs and other ones so i feel like i'm doing okay against these fields i'm interested to see world series poker mixed game events fields feel really different because you have a lot of players who who cannot play the games at all who just are absolutely terrible at a lot of these games barely play them um you, you almost have none of those online like online most of them can play a little bit but you also have at the World Series of Poker people who play real big mixed games, right? Like they're they're playing they're playing a lot of these games as as part of a mix, and they're playing for super high stakes, and they're very sharp, and they're very good at the live aspect, right? And that used to be the thing that I was probably really strong at. I was probably stronger at live poker and all the tells, and especially again, we talk about draw games and we talk about stud games. There are a lot more tells than there are uh, in flop games because of just you know handling cards and the way that you know, people's eyes react to cards. There's way more tells in, in draw games and stud games. And that's probably where I have actually less experience in the field, whereas I used to have more experience in the field. And um, yeah, I'd love to ha hear Daniel's talk about uh, thoughts about tells in these games, because you don't, you don't play the mixed cash anymore either, but you've obviously built up, uh, you know, 20 plus years of playing a lot of those high stakes games. Oh yeah. I totally agree with the idea that like bottom line is in limit poker, each bet is far less significant. So people are generally speaking more casual, more relaxed. Mm -hmm. A lot of bets are kind of automatic. So emotions, whereas like, you know, in no limit, people are considering betting like 60% and they're taking 30 seconds and they're really methodical. And when you do that, obviously you, you, you see less, but often I think when people play mixed games, like stud, like you said, they're watching the cards, they're doing less, but like, they're not really conscious of the fact that people are staring at them or looking yeah. at them, you know, and people act more quickly. So sometimes like, you know, people reach for their chips, you know, like you, you're like, Terrence, you're going to bet and limit hold them on the turn. And you see the guy already grab his chips to call. Well, right. you know, you haven't bet yet. Like you can actually just like not bet now, you know, knowing that information stuff. So yeah, I think because it's a more casual environment and each bet is less in terms of importance that people are, are giving away a lot more for sure. Yeah. And that's what makes it fun for me too, is because the pace of play is fast and you guys have heard me, I, I won't go on the rant again about how slow no limit is, uh, but you guys, you guys have heard me go on this rant, but that's part of the, one of the fun things that's still fun about limit poker is it, it plays fast. People make decisions fast. You get to do a lot of stuff, right? You know, you get, you get to play a lot of hands and do a lot of things. You're always in the action uh, whereas no limit, you know, is a, uh, there's a, there's a lot of sitting and watching other people, which is, you know, not what I'm so good at. <laughs> Um, yeah, I just think maybe, uh, you know, you've taken, taken a couple of months off. Uh, how sharp are you? Uh, can you walk right into the World Series, a complete full schedule of six weeks of poker after taking a bunch of time off? Um, do you worry about not being as sharp as you were when you stopped playing and, uh, you know, all the life things that came at you? Yeah, no, actually, it's not even just like a little bit of poker. I'm playing no poker. You know, uh, once, you know once I take this break, the only thing I do poker-wise, I watch the Tritons every morning. Just get a sense for what the top players are doing and, you know, ideas – I, you know, I, it helps me create ideas in terms of ways in which I think I can exploit some things. Uh, and that's kind of how I approach the game in terms of the way I think about it. But as far as like getting reps in, you know, I, I don't need to do that. Like, I think if you're in your 20s and you're learning, you know, it's really important to stay fresh. But once it starts, I'm good. The mo For me, my main focus is like, am I energetically there, right? And like I said, this has kind of been a, a good little test today because like I said, 7 a.m. I've been getting woke up and I sleep like a baby normally, but it's affected me significantly. And that's just like, it's, it's actually even more confirmation that I'm onto the right track of like, if I don't get enough sleep, I'm not worth playing because I'm just like, I can't, I can't function, you know, as well. I mean, I, like I said, I envy those people that can get off on five, six hours of sleep, but if I don't get my eight, um, that's problematic, but no, I'm ready to play. I, I mean, I'm so that's the thing. I'm not ready to play today because I'm tired, <laughs> but by Tuesday, I'm going to get some sleep. And as I said, I'm going to have a room for the entirety of it. Every time I make a day two, I'm going to stay there. And so I'll be just fine. Uh, all right, let's talk about your goals because in the past it was player of the year orientated and maybe, or oriented, maybe uh, some years you had bracelet bets and different things that you sort of um, also were looking after. But again, we're not, uh, we're not putting in days when you're tired. So you're, you're going to be resting, you're going to take days off, you're going to be mentally re, you know, recharging yourself. So how do you approach this? with goals in mind? Is it bracelet oriented? Is it money oriented? What, what's sort of your, how do you approach this world of series of poker differently? Well, like I said, the theme for this year has been quality over quantity. 
And so that's been working really well in terms of like, if I feel like I need rest, I'll skip a tournament. Um, I'll show up like later, um, setting myself up for success by being down there. And ultimately, the, I mean, the real big change this year is that I'm not going to spend 20 hours in the $1,500 Omaha 8 to finally min cash for $2,783 while the 50K is going on or, you know, a 25K is going on. So what I'm doing is I'll just be like, so for example, let's say I bust on, like I looked at the first, uh, first schedule. So let's say I bust the 5K on day two and there's a $1,500 Omaha 8. Normally I would go and play it, right? This year I'm going to take that off because I know tomorrow is a 25K heads up, which I don't want to miss. So I'm going to spend a lot less time. Um, I mean, the only small events I'll play is if the structure is super fast. Like actually I relooked at it and I realized that, so the second day there's a $500 buy-in, but it's a two day event. So yeah, you know, if, if I'm available, I might, I, you know, I might play that, but I'm going to really just kind of prioritize the big buy-in events and focus on, you know, actually I don't know that they've released yet the information about player of the year, but there was some talk about limiting the number of caches. And if that's the case, you know, I'll have a real chance. The one question I'll have is they, we still haven't released the schedule for the online yet. Right. And normally, you know, I play online and I'm going to scale back a lot on that this year. We, we cut it out of our fantasy draft. It no longer counts, but it's still, I believe will count for WSOB player of the year. So we'll see how that goes. But um, so if you're in a tight race, you might be forced to play some of them. Yeah, I think like, yeah, I think, you know, obviously push the envelope a little bit, you know, if you're in a tight race, but really, you know, focusing on winning a few bracelets, that's, that's the main objective. Yeah. And that's a story. This online thing, it's um, it's it's never been released this late this year. I know they're mm-hmm. trying to get some last minute liquidity agreements in place, I guess, so that they could try to get uh, these these people people from other states who aren't going to be traveling to the World Series in Nevada before they do that schedule. But it's it's definitely seemed to have upset a lot of a lot of the community that that these, these yeah. schedules aren't out yet. Well, no, you're so. right about that. Like Poker Fuse, I think today released an article explaining that you know. Yeah. Um, normally the schedule would have been out by now, but like, the, you know, the goal or the hope is to get, you know, like you said, the shared liquidity. And if you can do that, you know, you can have a more robust schedule and you can do a lot more things, potentially guarantees and who knows what. Um, and if not, you know, as a backup plan, you know, you sort of have to separate it out. But I ultimately, I think like with the online series, it's less, um, of a nuisance or it's less problematic for people. Cause like you're, you're, you want to come up for limit hold. You need to know when that is. Yeah. You coming out for two seven. You need to know when that is. For the online tournaments, it's going to be all week, every week, and it's going to be no limit hold'em. And there might right. be a few, you know, like there's nothing you're going to be like. When is the three hundred and thirty three double bounty deep stack? Like you know, it doesn't matter. You're coming to play the no limit. You're here. You're probably playing the main. You're probably playing the live. So you know, you'll play the online as well. So yeah, obviously it'd be great, but it's less problematic to for release sure. that late than it would be. You know, again, let's you know when is stud week? I need to know that because I'm I'm coming for those two events. Mm-hmm. Yeah. One other thing that changed this year was getting money in. I don't know if you've gotten money and loaded up your Bravo account. It used to be you just wired in um, and you could do that. Maybe, you know, you're a big shot. Maybe maybe they pulled some strings for you. But the rest of us plebes, we had to go through this new Payfinity thing. Kevin Mathers has been talking about it on Twitter. Um, but it actually went off without a hitch for me. So, you know, people ask, how do you get money to the World Series this year? It's not like it is in the previous years. You cannot send a wire directly to World Series Poker. I think you can, but it's, it's only if it's for like a huge amount. And if you're going to play cash and if you have like a history of playing cash there before. But like if you're just like a guy like me, you come play a few events and you want to send a wire instead of like bringing a backpack with 20K in it, um, then you have to go create a uh, an account at payfinity, payfinity.com. You've got, they'll take a wire transfer from you. I think the, the fee is 25 bucks. You don't want to do ACH because that's a percentage fee. That's 2.5% and that's way too much juice. Um, you'll get to send a wire to that and then that will end up going to your Bravo tournament buying accounts. And of course, if you are playing anything no limit, especially you want to register through Bravo. You do not want to stand in those lines for an hour for the first three levels of the tournament. Um, that's not a good experience. So pro yeah, tip out there. Uh, if you haven't done that already, you plan to play a few again, set up your payfinity account, get that money into Bravo. Yeah. Good point. Several people asked me this, so I'll throw it out here just in case. So for those of you that were in Bahamas and you got to use the awesome, amazing WSOP plus app that was mm. uh, cleared for Bahamas where you just boom, boom, you're in, you're good. That will not be available this summer at the World Series of Poker. It hasn't been cleared. Hopefully, you know, it will likely be, you know, be uh, available again in the Bahamas. 
But uh, as far as it, like, and then that's out of their hands. It's all about regulators and stuff because that app was pretty seamless. A lot of people really enjoyed, you know, how, how well that functioned. So we'll see. Uh, so I'm a bit different than you guys. I am uh, in town and I'm going to be in town to play a lot of cash games. Um, so uh, a, a little bit different as far as goals go. Uh, um, my goals revolve around hours, playing well, um, you know, taking breaks, doing that kind of thing, rather than, you know, grinding away in the tournaments and and, and focusing on that. Um, but Terrence, what, if you look at, you know, the time, you know, granted, you're not going to be down here for a long time. You've got other responsibilities, but sort of what are your goals as far as, uh, the world series of poker goes, it's just go as deep as you can in every tournament or is, is there more to it? Yeah. I mean, go deep, play well, win bracelets. That's, that's always a goal every year. Yeah. Got my, got my online bracelet out of the way. Then everybody told me online bracelets don't count and have to go again, <laughs> go again, win a real one. I don't know. What are you gonna do? Let's that's, do it. that's for sure. I mean, and and you know, just I, I'm 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 happy to be there. Like legit happy to be there. I mean, that's not to say that I that I won't be unhappy if my results suck or you know if I if I bubble all the ten k's and that I'll just I'll be pissed as much as everybody else is in that situation. But um, I'm just gonna try to play well and and you know this is this is my time of the year. Um, you know, because I because. The rest of the year, I sort of just play like online cash in little drips and drizzles uh, when I can, when when the kids are sleeping, whatever. That's when I play poker. But this is the time where I get to go and, and focus and play on poker and, and compete with with the best. And it's it's so much fun to do battle with the best. And it's sometimes even more fun to do battle with people who aren't very good at all because, you know, <laughs> that's fun too. just exploiting the fish. So your Badoogie, uh, Limit Hold'em, Triple Draw? Is that your schedule uh, primarily? Yeah, I mean, I might play like the, the there's a, you know, Daniel mentioned uh, Fast Structures too. There's a there's a 1K, you know, Turbo Bounty No Limit. I don't fucking know how to play No Limit anymore, but I'm going to, uh, why not? It's, it's what, how bad could it, I can't be that bad at 15 big blinds, right? I don't know. <laughs> Especially with a uh, bounty. Yeah, exactly. It's like, he went all in. What should I do? Call. I cover him, <laughs> so so I should probably call. I have covered. Call. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, I mean, yeah, it'll be, that, that's mostly it. Yeah, the the draw games and the limit hold'em games, and uh, I think there might be a, I think there might be a stud variant. And yeah, there's a stud if I bust out of like the 10k triple draw real fast or something. Uh, and then getting together with friends, right? I mean, uh, Terrence, you and I, I, I think we look at this like a, a little bit of a summer camp, especially me probably more because it's a cash game. Uh, environment for me where I can uh, yeah, I can take a dinner break button and go uh, f off for ninety minutes and and have dinner with a, an old friend or something like that um, at a world class restaurant. You're yeah, gonna have dinner at a world class restaurant if you want. Yeah, absolutely. So um, for all those coming into town, I think I'm going to be there for for a fair amount of time. If uh, if we're buddies, let's uh, let's go for some meals. And Terrence, I'm sure you're the same way. Looking forward to to having dinners with friends and too. And I, Daniel, you're commuting back and forth and, and playing the, the full tournament schedule. So you probably uh, don't prioritize social events because you're asleep and play poker, right? Over 10 years, maybe 20, maybe 15, I have not had a single meal with another human being during the world. <laughs> it does not happen. I That's do amazing. Not do dinner breaks. I, I take my rest, you know, again, go to the big 4th of July party. No, no, I don't eat. Even my, even my, I don't even eat with her. She eats yeah. up her own. I'm like, hey, I got good news for you, though. You know what? You can really focus this year because there's a certain hockey team whose games that you do not have to attend this year. That, that won't be a blessing in a way. Yeah. That was actually kind of a blessing because, yeah. you know, with them being out, like, I don't have to start the World Series, like, getting drunk and doing drunk vlogs. And it also <laughs> allowed me, you know, to just focus on just getting healthy. And, you know, I've been golfing a little bit this year. I, I was actually. I looked at my thing. It was three and a half years. I didn't golf. I couldn't believe it. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, so I played about it. I just became a member at South shore here in Lake Las Vegas. It's a beautiful course, just absolutely gorgeous. Um, and you know, now that I'm a member, I can just take my own golf cart and just, you know, and live the, live the golf cart lake life and just go play whenever I want. And I, I'm usually an afternoon guy and that's an older environment. So teeth sheets wide open. And I've been like really just sort of soaking that in. Cause I know it's the calm before the storm. Once the world series hits, having said that, because like I want to you know take some me time this series like like if there's a fifteen hundred something that I don't want to play I'm just gonna go I'm just not gonna go and I'll go to the golf course maybe or I'll just lay on the couch and do nothing maybe you'll even eat a meal with another human who knows get wild that. That. <laughs> are we gonna get any uh, are we gonna get some golf vlogs that that would be awesome you know, yeah. maybe I'll go eat with Alex Boxen and we'll order something and he'll eat off the plate that I eat but he'll eat all the stuff that I won't eat and I'll eat all the stuff he won't eat. <laughs> 
So I'll eat the vegetables and the rice, and he can have just the meat. Yeah, <laughs> that's perfect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We need uh, we need to uh, on the greens making putts, uh, those kind of logs too. That that'd be a lot of fun, I think. Uh, we'll see. Awesome. Uh, okay, guys. Well, uh, that's going to wrap it up. I think we uh, we're, we're setting up the World Series of Poker here. All three of us are are engaged and ready to go. Roscoe, you're gonna you're gonna watch the festivities from afar, so to speak. And we'll try and Terrence and, and Ross and I'll try and sneak in a, a podcast here and there and talk about how things are going. Hopefully, bracelets for everybody. Um, and uh, and and good luck to everybody coming to the World Series. Uh, honestly, like if you're coming out there and you're gonna enjoy yourself. Uh, putting your money down to pay for hotels and and, and entry fees, uh, have fun and uh, and enjoy the experience because uh, it's fleeting and and uh, enjoy it with well, while you can for sure and and uh, pop in if you see any of us and I'm, I'm sure everybody will say hi to Daniel. I, I'm sure you get uh, uh, everybody waving at you, Daniel. Um, but uh, uh, if 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 we know you, you wave at us and and yeah, I mean even Adam and I appreciate. I got to say like I, you know the number of people who just stop me randomly and say they listen to this podcast or you know they're in an elevator it's it's great and so you know yeah. you know daniel gets the shit all the time but we're uh you know adam and i are real real happy always to meet fans and uh, i know daniel's happy to meet fans too when when you're at the table not when he's on a bathroom break <laughs> there you Thank go you. <laughs> all right everybody thanks for joining us uh good luck to uh, everybody out there again um and we will talk to you soon peace